What is it that makes cats so special? What is it that's made them even more important to us today? And when you put it in the context of modernity and the disappearance of wildlife in humanity's habitat, how does the cat occupy that vacuum that's left behind? I'm an animal photographer. We're here at my studio in Shoreditch, London. And I'm just at the, the end of a two and a half year project looking at cats titled Feline. At the heart of this project was to amass the essence of feline. When we first domesticated them, they were revered and then they were reviled under the witch hunts. And now they're kind of online superstars. And I tried to trace not just the evolution of the feline, but also how that thread through culture has changed, how we've chosen to shape the animals. And the majority of breeds came about in the last 50 years. What was it about us wanting to be godlike, to shape them? Collaborating with scientists, I'm there toing and throwing, which is probably a healthy thing because it's giving it a foundation. I'm fighting for something, he says you can't have it, he said you can have that. And, and I think that probably meant that we, we worked harder to understand the research behind the cat. But what I really wanted to do here was go down a journey and explore the different questions, like why do 75% go mad over catnip? And evidence through a paper says that it reduces mosquito bites. And apparently the ones that don't like that particular catnip have another plant that does the same job, but it kind of opens up something about our experience of a cat. So it's a real privilege in a sense to be able to try to give visual form to this science and also to make it as relatable as possible. With Morten Quiddlebach, who is a neuroscientist, he sort of said, look, we could explore cuteness. Tim Berners-Lee, who's asked a question, tell us what surprised you about the use of the web. And apparently all he said to them after a bit of a pause was kittens. <laughs> And so then you're left with, well, why kittens have such an impact? And you get into what is cuteness. Having my brain MRI scanned in my own book, and then we put over the response areas, a kitten, a puppy, a human baby, activates a part here and, and adult faces on the side here. So the order of frontal cortex gets activated uniquely for infant faces and it does it at a speed of 130 milliseconds given that it takes about 200 milliseconds for us to have conscious thought. So we're forming emotions before we have conscious thought. And then, for example, my cat, and we show him photographed at different stages, which was initially done at eight days old, right through to eight weeks. And it's actually to scale. So you'll experience the cat to scale. And in a way, at some fundamental level, you can see how cuteness is unfolding. And then we go and explain it and how the proportions have been made in many of the breeds to be more juvenile. And we're doing it almost without realizing it has such a power over us. What makes them the ultimate predator? They are the fastest terrestrial animal. And even the domestic cat, they run faster than use and bulk on the short distance, given it has done a bit of training, of course. <laughs> Got these glowing eyes, the tapetum lucidium, which is these crystals in the back of the eye, that pushes 40% more light through. But apparently it's pretty crap when you're in bright daylight because they tend to flare up too much. So cats apparently have a lot more REM, so they're kind of chasing their prey in their sleep. So they can sort of optimize their skills when they need them. What would it be like to look right in the eye? We bought special lenses and using high-speed flash, we could actually examine that in great detail and show it almost like a lighthouse light, like a mirror. But the more ominous side of that was, of course, when the eyes glowed in the dark, there was superstition that that must be the devil glowing back. And they were sometimes burnt alive with the witches during the witch hunts. There are many things that I didn't realize. They actually have very blurred vision, less than a foot away. And that the whiskers create a 3D tactile map with the air pressure without even touching. Even the papillae on the tongue. If you didn't have those working well and you had fleas, you were never going to get them out. But to actually see them as these hooks and then explore the story behind it, I think it's really, really exciting. 
we have a whole page given over to an ear and there's a little sort of extra fold to the side which is there's a lot of debate about its function called Henry's pocket but apparently there are over 30 muscles that operate the ear and the pane can go 180 degrees. We only have three and uh, most of us can't, can't use them anyway but evolutionarily they have so much more capacities they can hear the chatter of mice no problem. The sand cat lives in very, very arid deserts. They have twice the hearing approximately of any other cat species. But when I'd read previously about it, it usually focused on the fact that their prey crawl around at night and so on. But it turns out in dry air, sound doesn't travel so well. Artists often try to explain about the kind of creative process. And I think as Picasso so eloquently said, I don't seek, I find. And I think with any project, it's what you trip over and go, wow, and then figure out, trace that back and how to deliver that. A lot of my images are very much like human portraits. They make the cat personal. I look at how we can make images more empathetic, informed by the old masters. I use techniques called counter shading. I'm fascinated that if you go to one side of a human face, it's more emotively charged, called left gaze bias. So I employ that in the techniques of my work. And so I'm bringing lots of different ways to in fact give more power and hopefully more connection and engagement. And I think what's been quite interesting in the collaboration is that as an artist, we're trying to organize an experience. We're interested in the cultural context of what we do and how it resonates in not always logical ways as imagery. Whilst working with scientists, there's a way of kind of grounding that imagination, but also in a sense, giving it much more powerful form. And then you've got the questions that are raised by this cat doesn't look real. And today that is brought into question even more so with Gen AI. The problem in the past was just keep the cat on the table because they do what they like to do. But now it's trying to prove that they ever were on the table. And so for that, we've had to kind of support evidence. I find myself as one of the most great photographers out there. And my style actually being impersonated by the genitive models. So I find myself when retouching an image like this, I would have retouched out the hairs that are flying in the air and the, and the hairs on the ground. And what we found that we needed to do was to reintroduce them and take imperfections and add the imperfections back into the picture so that the picture would still be deemed as being real in the future. Like future-proofing against the erosion of trust we potentially see ahead of us. We're at a time where we've never been more separated from nature. AI possibly meaning that we're going to be placing us up in a more virtual than actual world. And that it's important that we have, I think, connection with animals to actually imagine what it's like, not just to be in, in someone else's boots, but maybe in their paws or whatever that is. Cats do remind us of something about a wildness that comes into our place. They adapt our ways, and don't adopt them. Occupying a space that's maybe left by the absence of wildlife. Without empathy, it, things don't, it doesn't lead to pro environmental outcomes. That we need to feel something, we can know something, and the arts help us work, work with the emotions. The sciences give us the evidence on the ground. And that's why it's vital to have that kind of collaboration happen.